Good evening, everyone. And welcome to tonight's shop talk. Um, I'm Peter Miller, the Andrew High School Arts Director at the Academy. And tonight, it's my great uh, pleasure uh, to introduce Jonathan Berger, the Elliot Carter Fellow, uh, Rome Prize Fellow in Musical Composition at the American Academy in Rome. Uh, Jonathan is the Denning Family Provostial Professor in Music at Stanford University, where he teaches composition, music theory, and cognition at the Center uh, for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics, or CCRMA, a multidisciplinary facility where composers and researchers uh, work together using computer-based technology as an artistic medium and a research tool. Uh, he was the founding co-director of the Stanford Institute for Creativity and the Arts and founding director of Yale University Center for Studies in Musical Technology. Um, uh, Berger's compositions are often inspired by science and the human condition, including the adaptation of satellite uh, imaging data to turn the dispersal of an oil spill into music in, one, in the case of one piece, a spatial representation of brain activations of a schizophrenic hallucination, in the case of another, and sonic expression of chemical spec spectros I'm having a hard time pronouncing that word, spectroscopy of cancer, uh, in yet another. Uh, his symphonic chamber vocal and electroacoustic works are performed uh, throughout the world. Uh, this coming weekend, in fact, we will all have the opportunity uh, to hear uh, several of his works, including the Theotokia, uh, uh, performed by the Shrun Ensemble at Villa Aurelia on uh, Saturday night and Sunday afternoon. And I should mention also that Christopher Tropney, our other Rome Prize uh, uh, winner in uh, musical composition, will have his works uh, performed as well as part of a uh, varied uh, program. Jonathan is a recipient of three commissions from the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, he has also received major commissions from the Mellon and Rockefeller Foundations, uh, uh, Chamber Music America, and numerous chamber music societies and ensembles. Recent commissions include uh, Mylai, which was commissioned by the National Endowment, the Gerboda Foundation, and Harris Theater, uh, uh, and written specifically for the Kronos Quartet, who some of you I'm sure know. Uh, uh, Rinda Eckert and Van An Vo. Uh, and uh, he has several other uh, commissions from the 92nd Street Y and uh, the St. Lawrence String Quartet. <clears throat> and uh, Rime Sparse uh, for soprano and piano trio was uh, commissioned recently by uh, Lincoln Center Chamber Music Society and will receive its premiere in March with soprano at Julia Bullock. In addition to composition, Jonathan is an active researcher with over 70 publications in a wide range of fields uh, related to music, science, and technology, and has held research grants from DARPA, the Wallenberg Foundation, the National Academy of Sciences, the Keck Foundation, and others. So tonight, Jonathan will uh, describe his current efforts, including those underway at the Academy, uh, to express uh, the fragility and ephemerality of life through an awareness of sound and space in a talk entitled Clouded Silence, Music, Space, and Transient. So please welcome Jonathan uh, to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, the Academy, for giving me this extraordinary year. And thank you, all of you here, for not only for coming, but all of you fellows and fellow travelers and all else who have had a huge amount of influence on my work, much of which you'll see tonight. And as a disclaimer, if I, if I misconstrue anything that you've taught me, call me out on it later. <laughs> um, also, if Gregory is foolhardy enough to uh, watch the stream, I wish him safe and, and quick recovery. So I'm going to preface my shop talk with the very opening of my opera. In fact, I'm going to play more music than speak, probably. Um, my opera, The War Reporter, is the true story of photojournalist Paul Watson, who was haunted by the imagined voice of a deceased American soldier 
warning him not to photograph his mutilated body. Watson did take the photograph, which won him a Pulitzer Prize, along with recurring hallucinations of the dead soldier's curse. The opera opens with the sound of clicking camera shutters, at first barely noticeable. The clicks slowly crescendo and transform into the sound of a helicopter rotor. What you will not hear in this recording is how the sound is spatialized in the concert hall, at first appearing from a distance behind the listener, then gradually enveloping the audience before rising in illusory space, and as it transforms into a helicopter, descends upon the audience. My interest in transforming sound and in using space as a musical pre per parameter continues. I'll speak more about this shortly. But first, some thoughts about transience and transition. This 1930s stamp from colonial Libya was produced and circulated just around the time of the forced migration and internment of over 100,000 people from Jebel Akhtat, which ultimately resulted in the death of a third of the population of Kiranaika. Pictured on the stamp is a coin from Kiranaika minted around 500 BC, bearing a representation of silphium, a plant in the fennel fam family prized for its aphrodisiacal and contraceptive properties. The irony of the historical reference to ancient Kiranaika concurrent with the mass expulsion and extermination of its modern population is painfully poignant, but there's another bitter irony in this image of silphium. In his Naturalis Historia, Pliny the Elder writes a detailed description of Silphium, which concludes with an account of the plant's extinction due to human greed. Pliny describes how sheep herders saw more profit in allowing their animals to graze in Silphium fields than in cultivating and maintaining the plant. Overgrazing led to extinction. Pliny concludes his entry with a touching coda describing how the last remaining stalk of Silphium was cut and delivered to Nero in his own words, as a curiosity. Both narrative threads, one of forced migration, another of the process leading to extinction, reflect the fragility and ephemerality of life and the ravages of human greed. Both constitute my current projects here at Rome. One, a work titled Teut durch du Klinken, will depict forced migration through narratives of refugee children from Syria, Afghanistan, Eritrea, Kurdistan, Iraq. 
The second, a work on endangered species and ecosystems called Lost Songs, will reanimate the no longer audible voices of extinct species. These topics are not new to my work. Here, for example, is an excerpt from Mi Lai, my monodrama about Hugh Thompson, the American soldier who tried to stop a massacre of civilians in Vietnam. In this scene, Thompson, in hospice, succumbing to cancer, recalls flying the reconnaissance mission in 1968 in which he witnessed the atrocities and made a snap on the spot decision to intercede. Another example, my violin concerto Gia, transforms satellite imagery of an environmental catastrophe caused by a missile strike on an aging power station during the 2006 war between Israel and Hezbollah. In the work, I transcoded the dispersion of oil into the Mediterranean in a number of ways. In this instance, the solo violin traces the cha changing Baroque-like patterns at the edges of the oil spill.
No good place to stop there. She doesn't stop playing. <laughs> Before returning to these themes of transience in my current work, I'm going to say a few words about transience in sound. As most of you by now know ad nauseum, I'm obsessed with the transient nature of sound. Banging, scraping, plucking, vocalizing, blowing into and across physical objects, even squeaking and dripping, as I love to do, create acoustical signals. But it is the space and structure in which these sounds propagate and transform that ultimately constitutes the true musical instrument. There's not a night that I walk up the stairs back there that I'm not awed by these drips. I mean, they're so resonant and beautiful. Sometimes they're speaking to me in certain ways, but um, it's an amazing effect. Johann Sebastian Bach's fifth son, Carl Philipp, described how his father would test the sound of an organ by pulling out all the stops to test the instrument's lungs. In fact, Bach was not testing the organ, but rather testing the resonant and reverberant qualities of the church that housed it. I've adapted a variation of this method of testing acoustics by sounding an impulse and characterizing its response. The method is simple. I make a loud sound, record it, analyze it, and then create a virtual model of that space. The impulse I use is a bursting balloon. A pistol shot would be better, but Julia did not respond well when I asked her to secure permission for me to fire a gun in the Pantheon. So, armed with balloon and pin, I seek out and capture the resonances and reverberations of ephemeral spaces and situations in Rome. Initially, my goal was to refine the method with composition in mind, but serendipitously and unexpectedly, an extraordinary research project emerged. At a reception my first week at the Academy, I was introduced to Alessandra Capodeferro, director of the Museo Nazionale Romano de Palazzo Altemps. I described my interest in modeling resonant spaces. Not knowing what she was getting herself into, Dr. Capodeferro suggested that I visit the chapel in Palazzo Altemps. Completed in 1612, the chapel is a highly resonant structure with complex acoustics. Construction of the chapel was overseen by a lover of music himself an amateur composer. Along with the construction of the chapel, a significant composer was selected to oversee the musical activities in the church. Thinking back to Bach's testing the lungs of a church, I asked myself, to what degree did acoustics play a role in the architectural design of the chapel? And more generally, how does, arch how does architectural space transform the performance of music? Do specific acoustical characteristics of a space affect the way site-specific music is composed? As it turns out, the manuscripts of music composed for services in the chapel still reside in the Palazzo's Biblioteca. And with the wonderful assistance and support of Dr. Capodeferro and Daniel Fortuna, we've been, a we've been granted access to these treasures. Talia is currently busily transcribing selected works from the collection. And once transcribed, will be able to reanimate the sound of the music in the chapel. As a preliminary proof of concept, I took an excerpt of a work by Felice Anerio, the chapel's composer. This example uses synthetic sounds that, while far from beautiful, approximate vocal timbre. The first example is without reverberation. And now heard through heard, heard as if it's played in Palazzo Altemps. I'm just going to play the very opening dry versus wet, just to give you a sense of the extraordinary difference between them. Sorry. Dry.
By way of comparison, we created an impulse response model of Chiesa de Gesù. Here is the same excerpt of an aria, first dry, now in all temps, and now in Jesu. The eight, eight and a half second decay time in Jesu makes it very unfriendly to complex polyphony. If synthetic voices don't cut it for you, here's Elvis Presley singing in his Nashville studio. You saw me crying in the chapel. And now he's singing in El Temps. And finally, crying in Jesu. A final example. I borrowed a recording of Byzantine chant done by my colleagues at Stanford, Bissera Pincheva and Jonathan Abel. First, here it is recorded in a near anechoic environment with virtually no reverberation. Now in the highly resonant resonant Chiesa de Gesù with its considerable smearing and blurring. And finally in our temps with its warm resonance but relatively modest decay time. Chiesa de Gesù may be wonderful for creating a sfumato effect fitting for chant, but the acoustics of Altemps preserves clarity and, and is thus far more amenable to the polyphony that characterized sacred music of the 17th century. Decay, resonance, and reverberation define the transient nature of sound. These dynamic features of sound are central to my music in terms of timbre and orchestration, but also in terms of larger issues of musical structure and form. But what does any of this have to do with extinction? Just as I'm trying to reanimate the sound of lost music in San Aniceto, I'm attempting to reconstruct lost sounds from a natural world collecting compelling instances from places as disparate as Wyoming, Lesotho, and the Amazon. I'm collecting sounds of species and ecosystems being driven to extinction as a result of human greed. This golden tree frog was listed as extinct four years ago. A three-second recording of its voice is all that remains. Using an approach called physically informed synthesis modeling, I recreated an approximation of the vocal mechanism of the frog. In this example, the first three seconds of audio is the recorded sound of the frog. Everything that follows is synthetic and processed. This is a sketch of the electroacoustic part of a work for string quartet and electronics, which Kronos Quartet will premiere in 2018. It's my hope, although no promises, that it will evolve into the first movement of what should be a four movement work. The second movement will be an expression of Texas wild rice, nearly extinct due to water mismanagement. Acoustic transcoding of the genomic map of the species will give voice to that rice. Anyone who's working in Casa Rustica and hearing horrible voices from my, from sounds from my part of the building, this is the genome of Texas rice, or at least the beginning. 
a likely candidate for the third movement will be the passenger pigeon. Once the most prevalent bird in the United States, the pigeon's behavior to flock en masse, creating dark clouds and great nuisance, resulting in government incentives to exterminate the birds en masse. The only remaining species died in captivity in 1914. The challenge here is that no recording exists of the bird, save for written descriptions of the sound it made. However, knowing the physics of its vocalization and a good deal about its anatomy, and the help of very smart graduate students, I'm hoping to build a physical model of its vocal mechanism. Annalisa Mehta's vision to portray climate change viscerally rather than quantitatively has inspired me to complement her work with an imaginary soundscape suggestive of a changing climate and environment. Here's a movement from our Cinque Mostre installation southward when Rome will have gone to Tunis. On the north end of the, uh, of the installation are sounds that were all recorded here that in my mind at least are, are somewhat suggestive of current climate and potential changing, cl changing climate. On the south end are sounds that are, are inspired by or suggestive of um, North African climates and, and natural sounds. For Fu and Racheli's currently unnamed installation, <clears throat> I use granular synthesis to transform readings by three Rome Prize authors until they suggest environmental sounds such as cracking ice and wind. Here, Hussein becomes drops of water. I'll conclude with examples of transformation and transience in my recent string quartet, Swallow, which will be performed here in June. Swallow is a, a memorial to my brother Michael, who many years ago turned me on to a blues singer named Mance Lipscomb. Michael was also an amateur ornithologist and loved birdsong. He really taught me to listen. So here I create a world in which blues of a sort is transformed into the song of an imaginary bird. This is the opening of the first movement. In the second movement, the viola takes the blues inflections of the first movement 
and at least in my imagination, sings them through the vo voice of my imaginary bird. The fourth movement takes the bird song of the second movement and further distorts it in a scherzo whose trio becomes a drunken dance. I'll start in the middle of the movement. I arrived to the Academy with a sketch of a song cycle based on Petros Canzonieri and a looming deadline to complete the work. The cycle of seven songs for soprano Julia Bullock and members of the Lincoln Center Chamber Music Society begins and ends in uncertainty, opening with a ship traversing oblivion and closing with the image of a sailing a rudderless boat. Although I can't yet play the piece for you, it premieres in March, this piece is yet another portrait of ephemerality and transience. What you may, if you wish, hear this week is a new work written for the Sharoon Ensemble called Anchor Us, which takes its title from an Aramaic supplication chanted as the metaphoric gates close as the Day of Atonement draws to an end, an intense moment of transience. The work is based on my transcription of that prayer as sung by a Jewish immigrant from Libya here in Rome this past fall. I'm going to let my music have the last word on the fragility of life by returning to where I started from, the war reporter, with an excerpt in which the photographer, now in, in Mosul, describes a near-death experience.
Only people who had Prosecco can ask a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you were talking about the, the J Zoo and you said that um, multi voice or complex polyphonic pieces didn't really work so well, um, when it was built, they had essentially abandoned Gregorian chant. And really in the 1580s and 90s, they were the music that was being designed at the time the choir director was Polystrina. Right. And he was doing so how does that call and response singing function in that acoustic space in comparison to monophonic sound, in comparison to seven, eight part polyphonic sound that you get in this? Episode? Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. And first I should preface my answer by saying I am not a musicologist. Okay. Um, I am intensely interested in sound. And Talia, of course, is the expert on, on 17th, 18th century polyphony. Um, it's, there's, there's no doubt 
that highly polyphonic music was being played in all of these highly, highly reverberant and resonant spaces. That, that we know for a fact, including De Jesu. Um, however, um, if you think about the aesthetics of polyphony, where some sort of clarity bet of the, between the voices is essential, then a lot of these halls don't cut it. And you know, I, I, it's an unanswered question for me. Um, I think that for me, the more, the more positive side of that question is, were there spaces like San Anicetto where they were so pristine and beautiful and clear for, for polyphony that, that music emerged for it that, would, that, that, um, that adapted itself beautifully to these spaces? That's an evasive answer, but it's a great question. Wow. Oh. I had Prosecco, but I don't know. I only have the question in my head formalized, but it, it's amazing work. Um, I'm curious about how you are interested in dislocating time, for example, the extinct sounds of a bird, you know, like reconstructing that, as well as dislocating space. Yeah, that's a, f a f excellent and fair question. Um, so first of all, I don't I don't hear it as disassociating or dislocating. I hear it as re reanimating. In other words, I'm trying to re revive or reconstruct, even if it's in my mind, what these lost sounds are. Whether it's the lost sounds of of music in a in a particular space or the lost sounds of of a species or a, or an ecosystem. Um, there's no doubt that um, that a lot of my music is, very, is cannot be played just anywhere, right? The um, the operas I had to rewrite and rethink when they went from a circular concert hall in, in which I can place 30, 40 speakers around and control the sense of space when it got transferred to New York and was in a rectangular box and and you know there's a there's a um, there's a trade-off there, right? And so part of that trade-off is rethinking how space works there. Um, I would never try to do an ambisonic piece in a, in a, pla in a place like, um, like Tully Hall or Lincoln Center. And wonderful halls, but, but they're not built for that. And so, um, so when you do, or when I do work that involves immersive sound, it can only be done in particular places. It's, it's not necessarily transferable. Yeah, what's saying? So, um, been there, done that. I mean, that's that's sort of my 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 deep past in computer music is is um, automatic composition systems and style replication and all of that. Um, and then I moved into sort of learning about interaction and and tr how to simulate. My ideal for many years was simulating a chamber music environment where the computer is listening and responsive. Um, all fantastic. And these are the kinds of things that Chris Christopher is doing so. Wonderfully, um, and I've I've sort of left that behind, and for me the computer is not um, the computer is 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 a um, a point of exchange between collaborative work, 
And so one way to think about it is that my work as a composer is incredibly isolated and isolating and self-isolated. I work in, in a little corner. Right now it's Casa Rustica, but, but, but even at home, I work in the this, this small rooms and, and um, nobody has ex access to what I'm doing and most people aren't even interested in what I'm doing. And so you know, there's sort of this isolating world that, that comes out. And, um, and years ago, particularly when I was teaching at Yale, I, re I got very jealous of scientists who were working collaboratively. Of course, you know, it, once you start doing it, you see that it's not all <laughs> quite what it cracked up to be. But, but, um, but I did start working particularly with, with a mathematician who to this day I work very closely with. Um, and that sense of collaboration puts the computer as a tool, as sort of an intermediary tool, right? But it's not, it's not doing the work. It's, it's, it's all the planning and talk and thinking about it. And so this work that I'm doing in terms of reanimating re sound is, is with people at Stanford, Jonathan Abel for one and um, other, some of my graduate students. And it's this dialogue and conversation about, about what happens. And then, you know, and then what's, what's magnificent for me is that we can then bring in a musicologist like Taya or, or, or this fantastic collection of, of materials and sort of look at it in a new way. So I think it's, it's an enabler in the sense that it allows us, the computer that is, is an enabler in the sense that it allows us to, to look at commonly held views about how music was performed or, um, in an entirely new way. And by be, being able to reanimate it, it, it sort of gives us a new, a new point of, of conversation. Um, I, I'm, I'm beyond the idea that computers will do our work. I, 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 that's of no interest to me, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Christopher. Oh. Uh, this ties into, I think, questions about technology and space. Um, I think what's really fascinating is you're using technology to To totally right on. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and again, um, the fact that, um, that by the good graces of Dr. Capodoferro, I pushed myself on, on that work um, and was given, you know, together with Talia, sort of free hand to really look at these amazing materials. I, I can't describe um, how moving it is to be in that chapel and then to go up to the, uh, to the biblioteca and take out these, these handwritten part books from 1604 and just look at them and, and, and manage them. And it's, it really is an amazing experience. So, so yes, I think that's right. Yeah. <laughs> but you still haven't named your installation, so, so you don't. Now that's, that's a really good question. I think the, the most difficult thing I've done compositionally was including a Vietnamese musician into the fabric of My Lai. Um, it, was, it was something that was uh, requested by the, by the Kronos Quartet. And at first I was very resistant to it, partly because, you know, in my mind there's this sense of, of appropriation, of cultural appropriation, of exoticism, and, um, and, and Every other piece I played for you has 
references, you might not hear them, but references to, to Jewish cultural music of different types, right? And I feel perfectly comfortable with that, even though a lot of that music are, are not my cultures. They're Libyan Jewish music and Iraqi Jewish music. And, um, it was getting to know Van, Van Anvo, the, this amazing um, musician, and sort of getting comfortable working with her and in that dialogue that I was able to sort of take that step and, and go beyond it. But, um, but I, I think on the larger level, my music is largely about, about, um, about inference of other music. For example, um, at that clip of Me Lai when, when Hugh Thompson gets out of his helicopter and he says, open the door, open the fucking door, um, there, it turns into this very tonal piece. And that, that tonal piece is, um, is a, a distorted version of a prayer that's, that is recited as the gates of the Day of Atonement close. Um, and so there was this idea of close, opening doors, closing doors. And in fact, as the opera goes on, doors become this, this constant metaphor. And so um, the, the comic relief, so to speak, although it's pretty scary in my mind, in the opera is that um, he turns on, Thompson turns on a tele, uh, television um, and hears this, this sort of stupid game show of behind door number one, behind door number two, and gets drawn into it as if he becomes the victim of this, ga of this game show. Um, so doors are constantly present. And um, this is a circuitous answer to you, but it is the sort of the cultural idea of the opening and closing gate in Judaism that actually drove a lot of that, that, those ideas. Thank you. Last question, Danielle. so many musical parameters that you can't find in those part books, right? Um, several of which I'm sure affect the kind of way they would interact with the space. Uh, tempo comes to mind, dynamic, these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious how you make those decisions, kind of, or how you're planning maybe on making those decisions uh, in, the, in the final iteration of the project. And also I'm curious, um, why you chose, and this I think might be related, uh, why you chose the term reanimation instead of maybe something like recreation. Uh, whether mm -hmm. you see those as different or um, whether, whether these kinds of decision might, might influence you one way or the other. Um, let me start with the reanimation. Um, I don't, uh, I think every time a, a musician takes a piece of music and performs it, they're recreating it, right? And a score is nothing, sh nothing more than some little graphic roadmap that gives hints of what to do. And the brilliance of making music is when it becomes interpreted by the performer, right? And so that's constantly recreating. That's, that's, a, that's a given for a performance of music. I think what, what I'm thinking of here in terms of using the word reanimating, and honestly, I haven't given it that much thought. I can change it. You can convince me. But um, the idea of we're, we're reanimating the space. We're not reanimating the music. And so it's, it's, it's about understanding the characteristics of the space and how that music went in. You're absolutely right that tempo, dynamics, all sorts of factors that are not written into the music here are, are certainly at play. But how do performers make these decisions all the time? I mean, Bach. It's very rare that you have a dynamic marking in Bach. It's very rare. That, I mean, you don't have you don't have ligatures. You don't have phrase marks. So you're constantly doing that interpretation. And you know, one way to think about this, my, my you know, one way to think about it is Gustav Mahler. So Mahler would write a symphony, and because he was also a great conductor, he would conduct it in six dif six different cities around the world, the best concert halls, and we have evidence of Mahler reorchestrating on the spot because he would listen, just like Bach and the lungs, he would listen to what the music is doing in this space and he would take out an instrument or add an instrument. And so that, that for me is reanimating also. It's not, it's not recreating, it's reanimating the music within the space. Yeah, last, really last question. Yeah, I really I 
share with you this word, this reanimation. So far, it's the best word to me. Uh, I'm very going to, to, to share with you why and what has to do this with the mathematician. Well, at the time I was editing this book series, The IT Revolution in Architecture, among the other books, I made one with Michael Leighton. Now, Michael Leighton, I don't know if you know. I'm uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> so, because when you said mathematician, I was immediately thinking to Michael Leighton. And so, uh, uh, the, 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 the title of the book was Shape as Memory. And the whole idea of Michael was that um, a shape, an object, a space, is not the thing within its geometry, but in a way is a condenser of memory actions that in some way are encapsulated in the space, in the object. So if we see um, uh, a chair, we tend to use geometrically or from other point of view, but if we start to look at the chair as a condenser, of memory actions that are related to it, then everything changes. So for this chair, this is not such an important issue. But for that chapel, that's right. the issue. And here is the client. So if the form is not the form because of its geometry, but because it's a condenser of memory actions, we tend to think of the memory actions like the geometry. But if we think at the sound, all another word arrives. So this is why I feel that the real idea of the reanimating the, the, the space is really very, very, very good word. And so far, I really share. But uh, this was really uh, funny. This shape as memory, I thought, is a good um, uh, little extra thing to, to give us a deeper That's understanding. That's beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. What a great way to end. Thank you. And thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Well, that was wonderful. I think it's a, a tribute to how rich your work is that you have managed to be collaborating with pretty much everyone in everyone. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, well. and in a whole different you know, well, it's, serious it's, of ways. It's, so. it's, it's, it's such a unique place to be. So, um, it's, it's such a unique place to be.